thank you for joining us for today's expert lecture. We're going to be revealing today the remarkable story of the world's greatest railway, the Trans-Siberian. And the talk today is based on a wonderful book titled To the Edge of the World, which is written by today's very special guest speaker, Christian Woolmar. Christian's an award-winning writer and a railway historian, and we've had the pleasure of hosting him as a guest speaker on a number of our Golden Eagle Trans-Siberian tours in the past. So we are delighted to have him back with us here today and showcasing this presentation for you. So I hope you enjoy the presentation and I will now hand over to Christian for today's session. Thank you very much, uh, Natasha, and uh, welcome to all of you. I'm sorry I can't be there on, in person on a train talking to you, whizzing through the Russian steps and uh, giving you this lecture, but perhaps Next year, we will be all together. Um, over the next uh, half an hour, 40 minutes, I want to try to really sell you the idea that the Trans-Siberian Railway is the most, uh, the greatest railway uh, achievement in the world, the most extraordinary uh, railway, as well as, of course, being uh, the longest and uh, indeed been uh, a very important part today of uh, Russian infrastructure. So uh, it, it is a, an amazing history. It is amazing that it got built. It's amazing that it's uh, essentially been kept running uh, over the last uh, 130 odd years uh, that it's been uh, uh, there. And uh, it's an amazing experience to, uh, to go on. So let me start off with uh, just a little show of what uh, uh, the line is. Um, the uh, main uh, Trans-Siberian is, is the one in red. Um, there is a line to the north of that uh, called the BAM, which I will talk about uh, uh, briefly. Um, and uh, you will also see there's, there's a bit in yellow, which, which was the original route of uh, the Trans-Siberian, which actually uh, went uh, through China to uh, Vladivostok. And I will talk about that as well. But uh, essentially, from uh, Moscow to Vladivostok is 5,700-odd miles, uh, you know, which, if you think about, it, is twice the length of uh, the American transcontinental. Uh, so, you know, it is... Uh, really, there is no competition uh, as to what is uh, the longest railway line in the world. Um, and as with uh, many of the railways that I have written books about, which includes American railways, British railways, uh, Indian railways, there's always somebody behind it who is really the key to it, without whom this would not have happened. And this is a guy in this instance, called Sergei Vita, uh, who uh, was at one point transport minister during the initial stages, later became uh, prime minister of uh, Tsarist Russia, and uh, had worked as a railway manager in, uh, in his early days. And uh, he really was the guy who uh, pushed through this project and uh, pushed it through um, for several reasons, actually, because you wonder why on earth did they build this railway line through the wilds of uh, uh, Siberia? And there was both a, a political project to, to unify uh, Russia. There was uh, a, an idea of um, uh, using the lands in Siberia for uh, agriculture. There was a potential of finding minerals. And there was a, a, a military case. Um, in other words, to, to extend Russia's real reach uh, uh, eastwards. And in that uh, endeavor, um, uh, the backer of that was the Tsar, who at the time was uh, Alexander uh, III, the last but one Tsar. Um, he was uh, the Tsar until the, uh, 1894. Um, the Trans-Siberian was started to be built, uh, built in 1890. Um, and it was him and his relationship with Sergei Vita which ensured uh, that uh, it, its uh, construction uh, started and was carried out. Now, this is entirely a state project, entirely done 
uh, on, uh, with uh, government money uh, supported uh, by uh, the Russian government, which uh, you know was a, 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 a pretty much uh, a, a uh, dictatorship of a monarch monarchy a monarchy dictatorship uh, at the time with uh, basically what the Tsar decided to do uh, the, the the government and the, and the people followed. Uh, now, if you go along the Trans-Siberian, you'll find a lot of little museums at some of the stops, and they all have pictures like this. Um, and I kind of love these because they 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 really represent uh, the, the the people who drove this project, the engineers who ensured uh, uh, that it happened, with all the difficulties, and we'll talk about those in a minute. All the difficulties of building a a railway line, uh, you know, across uh, one of the coldest regions in the world um, and uh, one of the least uh, inhabited. And, you know, there are dozens of, of these. We shouldn't underestimate, I mean, Russia was, you know, still pretty much uh, a feudal country, still very much dominated by uh, agriculture uh, in the 1890s. Uh, but it also had a lot of sophisticated people, and you only have to think of, uh, you know, it, it's music, uh, uh, like Tchaikovsky, you only have to think of uh, its uh, writers, uh, like Tolstoy uh, and Dostoevsky. And so uh, you, you kind of think uh, of Russia as both this amazing mix of kind of pretty primitive uh, kind of uh, methods of uh, ways of, of living, and yet a, a kind of quite... Uh, sophisticated uh, culture, and this is this is the Trans Siberia. This is a Siberia typical kind of scene that they had to uh, build the railway through. Um, uh, you know, noting of course that uh, uh, in in the summer it's quite warm. Uh, in fact, it's been exceptionally warm uh, this summer. It's been it's been warmer than it's ever been, um, uh, and that lasts from about April, May to September, October. Um, and the rest of the time, it's pretty frozen and pretty difficult. Most of it is reasonably flat, uh, uh, luckily, um, and uh, some of it is like this, is forested, some of it uh, was uh, just uh, pure steppes, kind of, kind of savanna. Um, and uh, you note that, uh, you know, these people are using pretty primitive tools. You know, there, there wasn't much uh, mechanization. I will show you a bit of mechanization uh, in a few slides time. But, but essentially, this railway, although it was started in 1890, when other countries were beginning to use quite a lot of mechanization in building their, their railways, uh, this is pretty crude stuff. You know, shovels and spades, uh, lots of uh, manpower, uh, literally thousands of uh, uh, men doing it. and. Uh, indeed, it was quite difficult to find people to do it. Uh, they were imported from as far away as Italy and Iran and uh, various other uh, countries around uh, uh, the south and east of, of Russia because uh, there was very little local population and what local population there was uh, was largely nomadic, not very interested in helping out in building a railway. Much of it is, is straight. Uh, you can also see that the the, uh, the the gauge is slightly wider than uh, uh, the normal European gauge. Uh, the Russian gauge is is uh, uh, five foot, and it was uh, instituted largely because they didn't want the same gauge as uh, the rest of Europe in order to prevent inv invasion. Indeed, that was pretty prescient uh, given what happened in the, the Second World War. Uh, so they built lots of embankments. There was lots of earth moving. Uh, not very much tunneling, um, and uh, you know, as again, you can see uh, pretty uh, primitive uh, uh, work methods, uh, fairly kind of basic uh, uh, skills. Uh, single track initially, although now it's all uh, double tracked. Um, of course, it wasn't electrified at the time; it was all uh, uh, steam engines. Um, and you know, here's one of the few pictures I managed to find with showing a little bit more kind of uh, sophisticated uh, type of, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, equipment uh, being used, still horse drawn, but at least uh, some, some metal involved here and, and, and some uh, steam, uh, steam diggers 
uh, of which clearly uh, the people are very proud. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 it was uh, relatively fast, actually. I mean, it was built in, in, in three major sections um, and to some extent simultaneously, um, uh, starting uh, from obviously from uh, the West and, and working uh, in but also starting from uh, Vladivostok uh, uh, on, the, on the Pacific and working uh, uh, eastwards from, from there. Um, now, did they work in the winter? Not very much. Uh, you know, you just couldn't really do much earth moving in the winter. Uh, you could kind of do a few of the tunnels, but as I said, there weren't very many tunnels. Uh, you could kind of do some of the clearing away of areas, but largely when the snow came, uh, the, the workers went back home. Um, you know, they just couldn't cope. And so essentially, although it took 10 years to build this uh, railway, uh, essentially you can think that they only worked for about five, at best, five, maybe six months of each of those years. Um, and then they had to start all over again, reorganize uh, uh, everybody again. So uh, again, an amazing feat, if you think about it, of, of how difficult it must have been to organize these huge uh, numbers of like literally thousands of, of men, of course they were all men, uh, and uh, uh, getting them organized, uh, working them for six months and then sending it off. And it must be said that they were reasonably well paid, and they had to be, and they were reasonably well fed, because again, they had to be. Um, you know, there was no alternative, and if they wanted to keep people uh, working on the tracks, they had to treat them uh, uh, reasonably well. So uh, uh, compared with other railways where, you know, there were very high death rates um, and, and lots of disease and whatever, the, the, the people were reasonably well treated. Um, and uh, towards the end, particularly to, on the western, uh, sorry, the eastern sections, they did use prison labour. Because uh, obviously Siberia was a land of nomads and it was a land of exiles, you know, you got sent to Siberia. So one of the you know great expressions, you know, being sent to Siberia, and you were sent as a political dissident or sent as uh, a petty criminal. Um, and then uh, they realised that uh, using these people to help build the railway would help, and there was an incentive for the prisoners because for every year they uh, worked on the railways, they got a remission of eight months uh, on their prison sentences, and they got paid a bid. And they couldn't really escape. There was nowhere to escape to. And what's more, they worked in gangs of 30 or 40. And uh, if somebody escaped from that gang, then all of them would be punished. So there was a real incentive for people not to, not to escape. And in any case, you know, how do you escape uh, uh, in Siberia uh, when there was you know, virtually no roads and nowhere to, to go to and very little uh, uh, to live off, off uh, the land? And I said there weren't very many tunnels, there were a few towards the uh, 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 eastern end uh, uh, when it uh, reaches Lake Baikal, that was a, a slightly uh, hilly part. And again, you can see the, just the sheer primitive nature of uh, the construction work and the, and the, the, the use of horses uh, um, and uh, the use of really uh, intense uh, labor. There was the odd mishap, I've never quite understood what happened in this photograph, but uh, something clearly went wrong. Uh, maybe it was a landslide or, or, or whatever. Um, and inevitably, in, in such a construction, uh, you would have uh, you know, some, some serious uh, 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 mishaps. And again, we, we should not underestimate the level of technology. Some of the technology was actually taken from America. There are quite a lot of the Russian engineers, uh, I showed uh, you the picture of that, those uh, early on, had been trained in America or brought uh, sort of American uh, techniques. Um, and so some of the bridges like this one were, were quite uh, sophisticated. You know, there were little, literally hundreds of bridges. And, and as you'll see soon, there were also some very long bridges. Uh, but there were literally hundreds of small bridges like this over uh, uh, rivers uh, and streams. Um, and built with uh, you know, quite a degree of uh, sophistication. And some of these were imported uh, almost kind of in Meccano-like uh, parts from, from America. 
or from uh, other uh, Western countries uh, and basically put together from a, a, a few bits uh, uh, in, in, uh, uh, when they arrived uh, in Russia. And there were several uh, really quite long bridges. These were the last things to be uh, completed. So some parts of the railway were completed early and then uh, uh, the, you, you, took a, you essentially took a, a boat across uh, the rivers, although in the winter sometimes they would lay tracks across uh, the frozen rivers, um, often requiring everybody to get out of the train because they realized that uh, it was pot potentially dangerous. Uh, so they'd lay tracks over the, over the uh, rivers and people would walk across uh, and the engine would be, and the, the coaches would be taken across and people would get back on the train at, at, at the other. There were various options. Or certainly in the, in the summer, uh, you would take a boat a, across uh, these uh, types of rivers. So literally kind of half a dozen uh, you know, major rivers uh, in uh, Siberia over which uh, these bridges were built. And these were, these were the most dangerous constructions because uh, people you know, had to uh, work on them uh, and essentially if they fell off, uh, you know, they would, they would uh, be killed. And that, that was uh, the major source of uh, accidents. But again, you can see this is, this is sophisticated uh, stuff. This is, you know, these bridges are larger. I mean, some of them were blown up, as you'll see later. Some of them were blown up in the uh, uh, First World War. But by and large, uh, you know, they have survived through to uh, uh, you know 120, 130 years uh, uh, later. Um, and an interesting bit of history here is that uh, the the initial bit was uh, uh, was was built through this. The, uh, 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 the China Eastern Railway. And uh, you'll note that this goes through Manchuria, which was and is still part of China. Uh, the point about this is that it saved about 600 miles uh, going, uh, uh, rather than going on this bit, which was not built until 1916. So for the first uh, 15 uh, years of the railway, it went through China. Uh, on, and and a, a town called Harbin uh, was uh, uh, emerged uh, as the headquarters of the China Eastern Railway. It, it was uh, you know, a, a quicker way of getting to to to, to uh, Vladivostok, but extraordinarily, it went through another country, and that's because China at the time, very different today. China at the time was a very weak country, uh, had signed an agreement with with Russia. Uh, really under pretty much uh, uh, duress um, to allow the Russians to build uh, a railway through, uh, uh, through its territory. Uh, much to the displeasure of, of uh, uh, the Japanese, who, uh, as we'll see in 1904, uh, attacked this port, Port Arthur here, uh, also built this railway um, and uh, declared war um, on Russia, Russia uh, Japanese War uh, uh, of 1904, 1905. One other thing worth noting here is, is this was the last bit to be built along uh, the southern bit of, of Lake Baikal. And uh, again, as we'll see in a minute, uh, you had to take a boat across initially from uh, just down from uh, Irkutsk across about 30 miles. This is the seventh largest, lar lar largest uh, lake in the world. Uh, um, and it, it also contains uh, something like a fifth of uh, the world's freshwater. It's a very deep lake. Um, it stretches up 200, 250 miles uh, um, uh, and, and presented quite a barrier to the initial uh, uh, construction uh, of the line. Uh, this is part of the China Eastern Railway. It was built on a, uh, again uh, as a sophisticated railway through difficult conditions and uh, was often attacked by uh, uh, local bandits uh, and, and the like. And uh, um, uh, it was, it was um, uh, quite unpopular with many of the, uh, of the, of the Chinese in, the, in the Manchuria uh, and was, uh, as I suggested, uh, highly uh, controversial. Uh, this is, this is uh, Irkutsk, which was the capital of, of uh, uh, sorry, this is Harbin, uh, which is the town that was built as a result of uh, 
the uh, railway didn't exist before. Now is a big uh, town in uh, northern China, famously as ice sculptors uh, in the in the winter in the main square. So wonderful ice sculptures which are built up uh, 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 every year. Uh, this is this is um, uh, you, 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 this is Britain's uh, only contribution to uh, really the Trans Siberian. Uh, which is to, to build these uh, uh, the ships, a couple of ships that were built in in uh, Newcastle and shipped over in parts uh, and uh, recon reconstructed uh, to use across the uh, Baikal uh, Lake, which we saw earlier uh, during the uh, early days before they completed what's called the Trans Baikal uh, Railway, which is a, a part actually which. Uh, uh, has again been abandoned. It, it's uh, now because it goes further inland, and so there is a part on which um, some of the trips of Golden Eagle go along, uh, but it's no longer used as as the main uh, railway between uh, uh, Moscow and Vladivostok. It now goes uh, further south in in the mountains. Uh, so uh, these ships uh, operated uh, until about January, and then it actually freezes over so solidly. Uh, that you then have to uh, uh, travel across it. Uh, this was uh, during the Russia-Japanese War, the troops trying to get across. In the early days of the Trans-Siberian, when it was first completed in, in 1901, it would take about 10 to 15 days. Uh, you know, the maximum speed was 15 to 20 miles an hour. Uh, they had to get across uh, Lake Baikal. Um, uh, it was all a very slow process. So that was one of the reasons why the Japanese attacked uh, uh, when they did. Um, and uh, you know, this was clearly a bottleneck uh, for the troops. Uh, they did try to, you can see that they don't take the locomotives across. And the reason they don't take the locomotives across is that they tried to initially found that the ice did not hold up the weight of the locomotives. And there are a couple of locomotives at the bottom of Lake Baikal, which I presume are still there. And so they then kind of had to take these uh, wagons across uh, on uh, uh, by horse and, and, and people pulling them. There were there were a couple of sort of uh, tea places in the middle because uh, these guys had to, you know it was thirty miles, so it would take a couple of days to do. Uh, and you can imagine what what uh, what hell it was like. Uh, and this is the the Trans Baikal Railway, which I as I said still exists as a, a sort of heritage railway, but is no longer, unfortunately, the main route by which um, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Trans-Siberian uh, operates. But it's, it's, it's undoubtedly one of the prettiest parts of uh, the Trans-Siberian railway. Um, and by uh, building the railway, they were not just building a railway, they were really creating the whole region of um, of Siberia, because, um, you know, as I mentioned, until then, it was all uh, exiles uh, and uh, a few nomads um, and, uh, you know, not very much else. So they, they built the stations, they, said, they built different types of stations. This is a, a type two station. Uh, they built five different types of, 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 of stations. Uh, and indeed, they, they built this station. The first time I visited uh, Novosibirsk, which is which was a town entirely created by the Trans Siberian. This station was pretty much uh, uh, still there as uh, as it had been built, and unfortunately, the Russians don't have much kind of sense of heritage. Uh, and it was it was this station was by the the, the museum, um, and unfortunately, they demolished it, and so it's no longer there. But I, I, it actually really was there the first time I went to. Uh, Novosibirsk and sadly, sadly, uh, uh, no longer. Uh, this is a, a kind of type two station. The, the types kind of were according to how big uh, the towns uh, they serve. Uh, and this is a type three or four uh, station. You know, it becomes uh, kind of smaller as you go along. And this is this is the, the kind of smallest type of station with little, little more than a hut, uh, and that's a third class. Uh, uh, on it, a little third class uh, waiting room uh, just for the few people uh, likely to use it. So, but, uh, you know, they, 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 they created the whole uh, really region of Siberia 
um, which until then had been you know, largely unpopulated. So they had to bring in people. Uh, and you know, this was difficult, uh, attracting staff. They sometimes tried to rehabilitate criminals. That was not a good idea because they didn't tend to uh, do their jobs very well um, because there was little supervision. And uh, you know, bringing in people to work on the railway was uh, a real uh, major task and major uh, difficulty. Uh, in the first year, they had a lot of crashes. The rails were, um, and you can see this, they had, they had very short rails. You can see that's called a fish plate, a connector, and you know what is this, uh, like kind of 10 meter long rails, uh, and there's an ex fish plate and so on. And that caused enormous trouble because uh, you know, if the fish plate, which just has four bolts kind of connected well, becomes uh, unstable or, or, or broken, it causes a derailment. And, and there were lots and lots of, of minor accidents and some more serious uh, and gradually they improved uh, the infrastructure, repaired uh, uh, all the rails and, and made it kind of uh, 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 a more modern railway. Um, I happen to love this picture because at least guys playing cards while there's all this wreckage around. Um, and, and this kind of incident was, was uh, uh, you know, clearly quite commonplace, uh, but you know, really not now. You know, it's, it's a very safe, uh, well-operated, efficient, far, not fast, but speedy railway. Um, and they, they sold the railway as uh, a way of getting to the east, because uh, it, it, it uh, was a way of, uh, once you reached uh, uh, Vladivostok or later Port Arthur, you could then take a, a boat through to uh, Beijing. Of course, you can now take the railway all the way through. Uh, and so they, they actually uh, sold it as uh, you know, the, the modern way to get to China. And this was uh, from the uh, International Exhibition in Paris in uh, 1900, uh, kind of advertising, you know, here's your trip from Moscow uh, to uh, Beijing, would take you about a, a you know, a, a quarter of the time that it would take uh, on a ship. So a much better way of doing it. And they actually, at the time, they, they bought this... Uh, uh, a train in to, to, to show at this uh, Paris exhibition and it had a, a kind of uh, exhibition on the outside on roller blinds uh, which showed the countryside. They had four or five of these roller blinds um, to show kind of the different aspects uh, uh, on the train to make it seem like you're on a moving train and uh, these roller blinds still exist and are um, uh, in the Hermitage uh, Museum in uh, St. Petersburg. Unfortunately, when I went to see St. Petersburg, I didn't know that, and so I didn't manage to see them. But they are apparently uh, in there, and, you can, you can, and, they, and they survive as kind of uh, an amazing uh, exhibit. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the first class was, was pretty good. Uh, you know, there, there was uh, no, no shortage of uh, amenities, uh, you know, even a shower, um, you know, a little library of books in several languages, uh, you know, excellent food and, and so on. So it was used by, uh, you know, the upper classes to, to, uh, uh, to travel, uh, you know, through, through uh, Asia. And it was a very busy railway. Uh, you know, this is a scene, I think, at Irkutsk, uh, where you just show, you know, that obviously freight has always been a very big part uh, of it, but also it carried a lot of passengers. Uh, and it, it, as we shall see, it helped uh, uh, immigration, but it was, uh, you know, right from the start, uh, very heavily used. And these are kind of early uh, people who, who arrived selling their wares to, to the passengers. This is a colorized, this very special technique of colorized pictures. This is 1905, so very sophisticated picture. Uh, and you can see selling milk, selling bread to, uh, 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 to passengers uh, uh, on the on the railway, um, and uh, you know, showing that uh, the railway did bring immigration. It, it uh, about one million people moved to Siberia in the first ten years of its existence, uh, and they were provided with all sorts of facilities. They were given land. Uh, remember, uh, the, the 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 serfs had only been. Uh, Freed in in, uh, in Russia much later than uh, in America, that slavery was ended uh, only in the 1880s, and so uh, you know to be offered land and, and freedom 
away from the feudal system was a great attraction, even though uh, it was difficult. This is Irkutsk, uh, which was the capital of, of Siberia before and, and uh, remains so. Um, and uh, the, the railway never actually got to the main town site of uh, the uh, uh, of of the river, uh, it's actually on, on this side of the river, um, and you have to take a bridge to get in, uh, go over a bridge to get into uh, the town. Yeah, Kutz was famous partly that it was where uh, lots of politicos, political people were uh, exiled in uh, 1825. Uh, the Decemberists they were called after an attempted early attempt at, at revolution. Uh, mainly by intellectuals, and they, they were they were uh, sent uh, uh, to to live out their lives in in uh, Irkutsk. Uh, and this is a, 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 the early days of, of Novosibirsk, which, as I say, was a town entirely created by uh, uh, by by the railway. And uh, because they they did build some schools, but they couldn't build churches everywhere. There was a kind of moving church. So they brought the church to you, not every not every Sunday, but but most uh, obviously Russian Orthodox. Inside, it was uh, you know kitted out with the usual icons and and the like, um, and uh, that's where you you would uh, uh, go and pray uh, uh, when when the, when the train arrived, uh, you know, every month or so. Um, amazing enough, it was used. Uh, the part of the Trans Siberian was really used for a, a road race, a Paris to. A, Peking, or rather Peking to Paris uh, railway, which was won by an Italian count, uh, who was the only one who uh, uh, thought of using the railroad. Uh, must have been fairly bumpy riding on the sleepers, but he was given special permission to drive along the railway. Even today, there isn't really a good road between Moscow and Vladivostok. It, it's a pretty dodgy road in the winter, it gets blocked. So the railway is actually uh, apart from aviation, the, the, the only way of uh, uh, getting across. And then we get the completion of uh, the Russian, so uh, the, the railway all in Russia, 1916 uh, uh, is, is uh, when uh, the, the, the railway is uh, the, the last bit, the bit I showed that, that was, uh, um, uh, that takes over from the China Eastern Railway. Um, and, uh, uh, this was probably the more difficult part to be built, but amazingly they completed it uh, in the uh, during the, in 1916 in the First World War um, with with some more difficulty uh, than, uh, uh, than than the uh, uh, rest of the it's called the Yusuri Railway. Um, so as you can see, that's where we now get a complete railway in 1916 all the way through. Uh, to Vladivostok. Uh, Habarovsk has been in the news recently because they sacked the governor uh, there. Uh, Putin sacked the governor and, and there's been large, large amounts of protests, which you might have seen on uh, television uh, recently. So you can see how distant that is uh, from Moscow, you know, some 5,000 uh, miles away. Um, and, uh, at the end of the First World War, there was uh, some battles on the Trans-Siberian uh, where they used armored trains quite a lot. Um, it, it was uh, uh, because it was the last part where uh, the communists hadn't taken over. They took over the rest of the country, uh, but they didn't manage to, to uh, take over the whole of Siberia. There was uh, a, a battle, uh, battles between uh, an admiral called Admiral Kolchak who was um, um, fighting against uh, uh, the, the communists. Um, and uh, uh, it, it took until really 1920, 1921 for, for um, the, the Reds to assert themselves over the whole country. Interestingly enough, my very own father, who was called Boris Kogulski, actually was asked to fight in this war. Um, he was born in, in Russia in 1896 uh, in Moscow and was an officer in the army. But uh, fortunately for me, because I don't think I'd be here, he refused to fight uh, and instead went uh, into exile uh, via Odessa and, and Paris, as many as many Russians did. Uh, but I certainly, I don't, if, I think if he'd agreed to fight, I don't think I would be here today. Amazing enough, uh, this is a Czech legion. Um, they took over the, the railway. They were, they were a group of about 40,000 soldiers 
who got trapped in Russia because essentially they, they, they were fighting um, um, uh, initially um, um, with, the, with, the, with the Germans and then they decided uh, uh, to change sides and they, and they wanted to escape and they didn't dare uh, try to go through uh, the German-Austrian line. So they then uh, uh, tried to go the other way towards uh, Vladivostok and uh, they managed to get into dispute with uh, Trotsky and they took over the line uh, for a while. I mean, one, of, one of amazing piece of history, which I'm, I'm amazed that, that Hollywood has not done a story on this because uh, they took over the whole line. There's this kind of group of, of, of Czech soldiers um, and uh, uh, they, they didn't really want to fight for Kolchak either. They just wanted to get out of there and eventually uh, they did so. But uh, it was, it's an amazing piece of, of history. Uh, those of you who know the film of Dr. Givago, uh, um, and uh, you know, this is a uh, 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 representation really of, of, of Trotsky, um, who is there on, on, on the left, uh, um, and uh, uh, who uh, actually was in charge of the Red Army at the time and, and ran the war from an armored train. Uh, to, to finish off uh, uh, the, 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 the white the, the white Russians, um, and the line was then used for a lot of uh, propaganda. This is this this says Sovietsky kinematograph, uh, which is a kind of theatre uh, or film or cinema, uh, you know, bringing the, the word of of, uh, of uh, the Russian communist throughout uh, uh, Siberia uh, by by train. Um, you know, once the once the war was over, trying to convince people of the of the delights of communism, and uh, uh, there was a lot of reparation to do. A lot of the bridges have been blown up, um, and uh, needs to be repaired. And and Stalin, who by then was in charge after 1923 after the death of Lenin, uh, was um, uh, was um, very keen on uh, ensuring that the Trans Siberian worked well. He developed some. Uh, Industry in the east in Siberia, uh, they made steel, um, and uh, uh, it, it was seen as an important uh, part of, of developing uh, Russia. So uh, the line was improved. It began to be electrified. It began to be uh, double tracked. This is a, a bit of triple track, but by and large, it was double tracked, um, and and it, it wasn't electrified completely until the nineteen sixties, but. Uh, Stalin's intent was clear. He wanted uh, an efficient uh, uh, railway. He built this uh, fantastic station uh, at uh, uh, Novosibirsk, um, which you know, is typical uh, Siberian blue color, uh, which you'll see a lot of. Um, and, you know, fantastic uh, building uh, of this. Um, but also on the negative side, uh, they opened up the gulags. Uh, in Siberia, people being sent to Siberia was obviously even worse of a punishment. Uh, you know, you were sent essentially to death camps. I mean, they, a lot, most of these people starved to death. They were made to uh, run very heavy labor. I don't know how that guy can get that round the rope up with a wheelbarrow up that incline. Uh, um, I mean, they're, they're, you know, the cruelties abounded, particularly after about 1930, 1931. Uh, uh, and um, in the Second World War, it was, uh, uh, you know, the Siberian Railway was a very important part of the, of the Russian war effort uh, because a lot of industry was moved out uh, to uh, uh, Siberia uh, to protect it against the, the, the Germans and, and so that they could continue uh, producing material and, and here cement. Um, and uh, they were also began building uh, what is the, the, the railway I mentioned before, the BAM, the Baikal Amur Main Line, which runs north of the existing uh, line. There are a few Golden Eagle trips, and I've taken one uh, uh, that goes there, and it goes north of uh, uh, in, into, into the permafrost. Very difficult to build. They started building it under Stalin's time, didn't finish it until Gorbachev actually opened. So it took nearly 50 years. They tried to initially build it with, with gulag labor. Uh, that didn't work well. They then tried to, to build it with prisoner of war labor, uh, and, and that didn't work very well. And, and eventually they, they finished it with a, a bunch of uh, 
uh, who were called pioneers. This was the, the German prisoners who were forced to uh, build this line. And these were the pioneers, uh, uh, the Komsonol, who uh, built uh, some of that uh, some of that line. You were promised, if you came and worked for it in the age of kind of 17, 18, 19, you would promise you'd get a flat and possibly a car and the like. Um, and uh, um, uh, my contention in my book, actually, is that this the disillusion with the fact that you know, literally a million of these young people kind of helped build this railway uh, and really found out the kind of inefficiencies uh, and, and difficulties of communism. And I think that they were one of the, the generation that actually uh, put pay to party thanks to uh, this line. But they're, they're, their posters kind of attract them and they're both uh, uh, girls and boys uh, were throughout, uh, throughout Russia. And this, this is part of the line. Uh, you can see it's 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 through uh, higher ground, and as I say, digging through the permafrost was very difficult because uh, it would melt, uh, and it but then it wouldn't refreeze in the in the winter, and so it was unstable, and and it took many years uh, to build. And this was the last bill uh, they built uh, this this uh, uh, tunnel underneath. That's the railway above there that was went over the hills, uh, and eventually this tunnel which took took about. Uh, 20 years to build because it kept on flooding was eventually uh, completed in the days of Gorbachev. So, so relatively recently, and they they built a lot of modern stations. I went to this station uh, when I was on the BAM, and it was just about as empty uh, now as it was then. I mean, the whole idea that of the BAM was to kind of populate the northern Siberia never really happened. Um, this is just a a shot, particularly with the American uh, uh, listeners in mind, viewers in mind. Uh, you might remember Gary Power and the U2 uh, incident, and this was actually uh, portrayed uh, still today in the in Novosibirsk uh, station, uh, which famously, uh, for those of you who don't know, a spy plane uh, was shot down uh, by a missile. The, 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 the pilot actually survived um, and was eventually returned uh, to uh, the United States, but it was a great uh, propaganda coup uh, for the Russians. So just I'll end with just a few pictures of what Siberia. Mean, again, that that is pictures I took. The, the the amazing that amazing kind of greeny blue color, which uh, I love. This is not a picture I took. This is the 1970s uh, uh, engine. Uh, this is the dining car uh, of a normal train, which I wouldn't particularly recommend. Um, they weren't really very interested in in serving us. Uh, apart from the old beer, uh, and this is the soup on the train. It's more appetizing than it looks, uh, but, uh, um, uh, and, and they used to come and say, uh, fish, pig, or chicken, fish, pig, or chicken. Um, this is a, a static, this is an engine, uh, an old engine that was in uh, uh, the Novosibirsk uh, Railway Museum. Uh, interesting enough, it was published in the mail on Sunday, and they rang me out to ask, uh, you know, was it was was the, the engine still operating? And they didn't really see that. It looked pretty frozen up and permanently stuck. Uh, this is me and my wife and uh, the the the, uh, uh, the uh, sleeping car uh, guard. Uh, you can see it was it was minus twenty when uh, they took this picture. So we were quite cold. Uh, this is the end. Nine thousand two hundred eighty-eight kilometers from Moscow. Funny enough, it isn't that anymore. They've straightened out a few of the tracks, and it's probably more like 9,000, but it's still a bloody long way. Um, and this is a station at Vladivostok, which was opened by uh, what was then the, 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 the who became the, the Tsar, the, the Crown Prince, uh, 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 Nicholas, who became the last Tsar. And uh, uh, he laid the foundation stone in 1890 when he happened to be in Japan, coming back from Japan and laid the foundation stone of uh, Vladivostok uh, station, which is actually uh, uh, named after him. This is a place called Ulan Ude, which is the first stop. We, we traveled from the west, from, sorry, from the east to the west. Um, and really the first section is two, two and a half days of traveling on the train with virtually nothing, apart from Habarovsk, which I showed earlier. There was nothing until we get to Ulan Ude. This was at uh, seven o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning, something like that absolutely freezing, kind of minus 15, minus uh, uh, 20, and that's not the coldest it gets. Uh, now this is the end of the line uh, uh, in, in Moscow, and, and this is the station uh, uh, where the, uh, the, 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 the train uh, starts from. 
Um, and, uh, and here's a copy of my book, and I hope you've uh, uh, enjoyed this lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christine. That was a, a fantastic lecture. It's so interesting to, to know, even though I've, I've travelled the Trans-Siberian Railway myself, and every time I hear more, hear a lecture like this or read a book, you learn so much more than, uh, than about the actual trip itself. And I'm sure you've inspired many people who haven't previously travelled on the railway to obviously go out there and, and uh, adventure, obviously, when we can do. So thank you very much for that. We have had a couple of questions come through and I'm sure people will send um, any more through, obviously once we've finished now. So one, the first question has come from a Patrick Hoggard who's just asked about the BAM route specifically. He um, hadn't heard of the BAM route previously so we just wondered whether it's popular with locals or tourists and whether it's a scenic line, if it's a line of interest at all. Okay. Uh... It, it is definitely very scenic. It, it's different from uh, the main line because it's further north. Um, uh, it, it's probably more foresty. It's completely wild. I mean, I mean the, the, the normal route is wild enough and you, you go for mile after mile without seeing anybody. The BAM was supposed to be uh, a way of populating that area of uh, the north but failed as, as uh, a project and once uh, Gorbachev left and the communists left, it was no longer really part of that agenda to uh, stimulate that area. So there's a, uh, the towns are a bit forlorn. I mean, they're not, they're barely towns. I mean, they're very small towns and they're fairly sad places. Scenically, it is amazing. It is, it is uh, a very attractive uh, uh, railway. Uh, it goes through uh, more hilly, mountainy uh, country um, it's very few people very few uh, passenger trains on it heavily used for freight um, because the the it connects with with the pacific um, and it relieves some of the pressure on the main line which is very busy and which then goes off to china so uh, it is used quite uh, heavily uh, for freight um, but as an uh, economic enterprise, it, it's, well, certainly as a passenger enterprise, it's not successful. As a freight enterprise, the, the, the Russians do claim that it's, uh, you know, reasonably profitable. I've got no idea of that their, their economics are not kind of uh, very transparent. Uh, but I would certainly uh, recommend it as, as you know, a, 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 even more of an adventure. I think the whole Trans-Siberian is an adventure. This is even more of an adventure. I think that's the, the, I mean, as you mentioned, we do the odd trip on the BAM route and we don't run it every single year, but when we do, it's hugely popular because, you know, you can't, you can't access it um, very frequently, as you've mentioned. So we're actually planning another BAM trip in 2022, so in uh, two years from now. So if there's anyone that is interested in traveling on, on that specific line, uh, then please contact us for details and, and we can send you the itinerary once that becomes available. Great, I think it's worthwhile. And let's see what else we've got here. Oh, someone's asked what is the difference between the gauge of the Trans-Siberian Railway and the railway gauge in the US? Uh, uh, the railway gauge in, in the US is four foot eight and a half, like, uh, for some reason, it's the same as most of the European uh, uh, gauge, uh, whereas the Russian is, is five foot. Um, and uh, why did they do that? They did that uh, uh, right from the beginning. Uh, their first railway, which was a, a short line uh, between St. Petersburg and, and the palace uh, uh, near St. Petersburg. And uh, they wanted a different gauge, as I suggested, to, to stop being invaded, to, 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 to not risk invasion. And uh, that in fact proved uh, very useful in the Second World War when Operation Barbarossa was uh, uh, launched by uh, the Germans and they intended to get to Moscow by Christmas and they didn't quite manage to. Uh, they got to the outskirts of it and they were definitely slowed down by the fact that they couldn't use the railways they either had to, at some point, transship everything from uh, the European gauge onto the uh, Russian gauge, or they uh, had to uh, build 
uh, the, the line change that move the, the rails across. And even though it's only kind of four or five inches, it, it makes a big difference. And you can't run one type of uh, rolling stock on uh, the other type of railway. So uh, it was a defensive measure and uh, they, they ended up building their whole railway network in that gauge rather than uh, the four foot eight and a half that is in use in the whole of Europe uh, and indeed in uh, 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 in the USA. Another question about was something you commented on earlier. Um, is the railway between Harbin and Vladivostok still in use? Now, that's a very good question. I tried to find that out, and I think I think there is still freight that goes there. But the maps tend to show, as as we saw. Uh, that uh, uh, it, 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 it doesn't exist any longer. I, th I think it still exists as a freight railway, but certainly um, no passenger railways go that way. So uh, uh, they, go, they, go the, uh, they, they go on, on the, uh, uh, the, the, the northern uh, uh, route. Um, so um, uh, I would love to find out is the answer to that. Um, uh, uh, for sure, one way or the other, but it seems, I mean, it's, it's a, a pretty hostile kind of countryside, you know, difficult territory, and as you saw from that picture, mountainy, and uh, so I, it may well be that they haven't bothered maintaining that bit of railway. Mm. And then another gauge question, um, what's the gauge used in China? Uh, uh, China is four for eight and a half, again, okay. so so uh, uh, you have to go back to it. So you go through, uh, um, uh, uh, you, you, go, you, you leave Russia, uh, you go to Mongolia, which is the Russian gauge, and then you have to change the, uh, 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 change the gauge. And, and they either lift the trains up and put them on new kind of uh, bogies or you change trains. But they, they often lift the trains up and put them on different bogies and, and and you continue your way. Um, in Spain, actually, where they use two different gauges um, for the high-speed train and the normal trains, they actually have developed ways of changing gauges without stopping the trains, which is quite remarkable. They actually change the gauge. They go through some special kind of uh, a mechanism which actually changes the gauge uh, so they can continue their routes without uh, changing it, but they haven't developed that uh, on the, the Russian uh, Mongo on the Mongolian border. No, because I think that's one of the, the fascinating things we've done on some of our tours previously where we've had to change gauge mid-trip and you've, and you've had to change the bogies and, and you know, for, it's a fascinating thing to watch. But I have heard a few, um, in, I think in Switzerland they're developing it as well now where they change automatically um, on, the, on the gauge. I think they were looking at that. So right, yes. It's, uh, 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 and that's a pretty amazing thing to do, really. And they don't do it at full speed. They do it at kind of 20 miles an hour, but nevertheless quite extraordinary technology to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. There's a question here about um, the Russian locomotives and where they were built or where they were largely built, the locomotives themselves. Do you know uh, on, on, uh, on the, on the, on the Trans-Siberian? Yeah. 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 Uh, um, well, the, the Russians did have a locomotive industry. Uh, I. I, I'm not a locomotive expert, so I, I never quite uh, inquired into that in great depth. Uh, but uh, from what I understand, they certainly were built in, in Russia uh, uh, rather than elsewhere. But um, I can't swear by that. I, it, it's something I ought to know, really, um, but uh, I'm afraid I can't answer that one. That's probably a question that I'll, I can ask our um, our company president for you, uh, Robert, who sent that in. I will, I'll take that back to him and I will get back to you. Yeah, I'm sure Tim knows Tim, that. Yeah, Tim, is, uh, he, he knows his locomotives well, so I will, uh, I'll ask him and I'll get back uh, on to you. The, the front of my, front of my uh, book, by the way, uh, says Trans-Siberian Express and, and the story of the Trans-Siberian Express, but actually there is no such thing as the Trans-Siberian Express. There's the Trans-Siberian Railway, um, but, uh, and that express was, was to, to uh, advertise the 100th anniversary, which I think was run by Golden Eagle, actually. I think that is a Golden Eagle trip shown on, on that completely coincidentally before I had any connection with Golden Eagle. Um, um, but actually, it's not an express. There is, there is a train that is faster called the Rossiya, which is train number one, 
and train number two in the other direction. Um, but uh, there's, there's actually no such thing as an express. They, they, they all go about 50, 60 miles an hour. They don't go fantastically fast, but they do go fan, fantastically efficiently. They tend to run absolutely to time. And if they say they're going to stop somewhere for 23 minutes, they stop there for 23 minutes, and you've got time to go to the shop and buy something. But don't wait for 24 minutes because they'll go without you. Well, that's how it should be, shouldn't it, I guess? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the train should be, you know, if it, if it all knew it was like that in parts of the UK, then we would, <laughs> it would be much more of an enjoyable experience. But um, I've just got a few more questions before we finish off. Fine. So um, we've, someone's just asking about the condition of the, the labourers. Obviously, you mentioned earlier about the, the gulags and the labourers that were working on the, on the railway. Um, do you know anything about their conditions and how they were given medical attention with, you know, obviously broken bones that they might have got and, and the conditions um, they lived in? We have to separate out the, the, the construction of the BAM with, with gulag labour, which was, was essentially slave labour and, and terrible conditions, and the construction of the Trans-Siberian itself, where uh, by all accounts, and, and there are some accounts, the, the labourers were treated reasonably well. Um, and even the prison labourers were treated uh, reasonably well, and, and uh, you know I've seen descriptions of the food. They were quite well fed. Um, you know I suppose with self-interest in mind by the uh, contractors, because um, you know they needed fit, strong men to build that railway, and so they did feed them reasonably well, and they paid them uh, you know reasonable amounts for uh, uh, the period uh, at the time. Um, and uh, yes, I've seen accounts of, of medical treatment for them. Uh, the death rate was very low compared with terrible railways that were built in Africa, uh, in Panama, and even to some extent uh, the American transcontinentals. Uh, so the, 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 the death rate by all accounts was, was not high. Um, I suppose partly because there weren't a lot of diseases. Uh, there were some diseases in the summer, but... Uh, but um, you know, they're, they're not vast uh, diseases um, and uh, the people were reasonably well fed. So um, that was one of the things that possibly surprised me when I started uh, uh, writing the book. I'd expected to see kind of lots of accounts of horrible kind of uh, practices and, and uh, uh, you know, near slave labour. And that's not the case. A question here about the German, um, the German expats after. World War Two and, and all, what ultimately happened to them. You know? That's a terrible story. That is a terrible story. I mean, I mean, most of them died. I think there was a death rate of something like seven, eight out of ten uh, died. Built. They were very poorly treated, uh, and most of them never got back to, to, to Germany. I mean, they were, they were essentially German prisoners taken to the end of the line and told to build the BAM and. Uh, um, uh, you know, it was it was um, slave labour, gulag type conditions, um, and um, uh, you know, most of them never made it. We've got one last question. Uh, so thank you very much for everyone who sent questions through uh, for Christian. Thank you. Thank Good you questions. Christian. I like the questions. <laughs> well, this last one is about a recent um, occurrence in Russia. It's just talking about the. The law that was passed recently to allow tree felling along the BAM and the Trans-Siberian line for the broader purpose of modernising the lines. And he's just asked what, what you make of this, whether you feel that modernisation of, of the Trans-Siberian BAM infrastructure is necessary. Um, I haven't heard about that, but I do know that um, there's a lot of concern about the environmental effects of the BAM. Um, and uh, the damage it caused uh, to what was a pristine environment and, and the fact, as I explained, that they melted some of the permafrost and, and the permafrost has a, you know, it's called permafrost precisely because of, of that, but uh, the name, uh, it is a permanent frost. And the, the problem with it is that if you melt it, it doesn't refreeze in the same way because it's got hundreds of years of, of freezing and so it doesn't refreeze in the same way. So there was a lot of damage. There was a lot of concern about uh, damage to waterways. There was a lot of fires uh, caused by uh, the, the railway. Now, how the situation is now, I'm, I'm, I'm unclear about, uh, but certainly, uh, you know, I've heard concerns about 
uh, the environmental damage and and uh, and particularly the condition of Lake Baikal. So uh, I must say, uh, without being cynical, and although I'm half Russian myself, um, anything the Russians say about the environment, I am suspicious of. That's fair enough. No, that is, um, and thank you for answering that last question. We've got a few more comments that have come through, which I'll forward to you afterwards, just so you can see the comments that have come through. Thank you. I'd love that. Um, yes. Yeah. And thank you very much again to everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Great, so all I'd say is, you know, do it. If you haven't done it, do it. It is exciting. There's nobody who comes back and says, oh, that was boring. I mean, some of the scenery is not great. And, uh, you know, it's quite a tough experience sometimes. But it is it is rewarding. You do feel. I mean, I call my book, uh, which incidentally I do have copies. If anybody wants uh, copies of it, do email me. Uh, I call it to the edge of the world because we flew to Vladivostok uh, and took the the first time I went on it and took the railway on the way back, and it really felt like we were at the edge of the world. I mean, it, it you really you know you you fly ten hours from Moscow. And you only just get there and, and then you reach the Pacific Ocean and you feel the Sea of Japan and uh, you do feel it's the edge of the world. So it's an exciting trip to do. So I, I would recommend it. So thank you very much and thank you very much for listening and I hope you all enjoyed it.